All right, in this video, we are going to joyfully slog through the derivation of the frequency response of a low pass filter. I am going to be mentioning a bunch of things covered in the last few videos in this playlist, like impedance and frequency response. So if you hear a term and you don't know what it means, you're probably gonna need to go back a couple videos. So I don't wanna have to reiterate every single concept here. Here's the basics. We have a resistor, a capacitor, we are sending a sinusoidal input voltage into this system, reference to ground and not bothering to draw the grounds everywhere. We are going to measure the resulting sinusoidal output voltage, and we want an equation that will give us the frequency response. So both graphs, both the output amplitude and output phase, amplitude being the ratio V out over Vn, and phase being the phase difference between these two sine waves if I were to plot them in the time domain, so what is the phase difference between them, or if I were to plot them using phasor notation in the complex plane, so on the real and imaginary axes, where say my input is represented by a vector and my output is represented by a vector, what is the phase difference, and then they're also gonna have two different amplitudes there, say A and B. So again, that is all a quick review of stuff covered in previous videos. In this one, we're actually gonna go through the full derivation for this circuit. So we are going to do this analysis using impedances because they make our lives easier when dealing with sine waves instead of writing out all the trig functions. So we have the impedance of a resistor, ZR, in series with the impedance of a capacitor, ZC. We have VN, we have Vout. <coughs> we know VN, we want to know Vout. We know that these impedances are in series, so the current through them must be the same. And remember that we know from previous videos the impedance of a resistor is just R. The impedance of a capacitor is one over C J omega. So remember we're using J to represent, <coughs> excuse me, the square root of negative one. Omega is the angular frequency there. So this is a complex number, which again ties back into the whole complex plane representation, and that we have impedance in general just defined as the ratio of voltage to current for a specific part, which for a resistor happens to be just the resistance, but for a capacitor is frequency dependent. We also remember that we can combine impedances in series or parallel, just like we can with resistors. So I can represent this entire circuit as a single equivalent resistance, ZEQ, where in this case they are in series, so that's going to be the impedance of the resistor plus the impedance of the capacitor, and the current here is going to have to be equal to the current I there, because again the parts were in series. So I'm going to write out my equivalent impedance, ZEQ, is just R plus 1 over C J omega, and here I also have Z equals V over I, so that is gonna equal Vn over I. I also know if I look at this circuit, <laughs> I can apply the impedance equation to each one of these parts individually, and my current is the same for each of them. So I also know that, for example, the impedance of the capacitor is gonna equal the voltage over the capacitor, which is V out, which I want. V out over I, and remember that these i's are the same. So I want an equation that gives me, I don't actually care about i, I want v out as a function of vn, but I know that these vi's are the same, so I'm gonna rearrange these equations to solve for vi. So here I have i equals v out over cc, and here I have i equals vn over r plus one, sorry, r plus one over cj, Omega, and I can now set those equal to each other because again, I know these i's are equal. So I have Vn over R plus one over C J omega equals V out over ZC. Now rearranging things a little bit because I want V out as a function of the other stuff. So I have V out equals ZC, which is, again, this is just multiplying this over on the other side, which is one over C J omega all over R plus one over C J omega times V in. That fraction is a little messy, so I'm gonna multiply that whole thing over 
sorry, times cj omega over cj omega. You can always multiply something by one. And then I'm gonna get my final expression, 4v out, which is, sorry, this got a little crowded over here, one over one plus rc, which you will recognize as the time constant for an RD circuit, j omega times vn. Great, this slide is a little crowded. So let's go on to the next slide. Because again, remember we want, this is a complex number, but we want to get this represented both as the amplitude and phase as a function of frequency. Okay, so I've carried over our equation from the previous slide, but we have like a complex number in the denominator of a fraction. What exactly does that mean? We are going to insert some complex algebra magic. So remember that A plus JB can also be represented in polar form as A squared plus B squared times E to the J inverse tangent of B over A. And again, that's the whole complex plane thing where you can have a vector represented either in rectangular, Cartesian coordinates, or polar coordinates. Not going to go over that again here, but we're going to use that representation to replace the denominator of this fraction. So this all becomes this big long thing, which is the square root of 1 plus rc omega squared times e to the j inverse tangent, pardon my handwriting, of rc omega times vn. We are going to flip this term up to the numerator and give it a negative exponent. So, and that's just remember saying that one over x is equal to x to the negative one. So that is going to become one over the square root of one plus rc omega squared times e to the negative j inverse tangent r c omega times vn. And what this gives us is a change in amplitude. So remember that this first part here, the j is gone, so this is just a real number, and a change in phase, again, related to that complex plane notation. So we now have v out as a function of vn, and remember that using this complex notation, Vn, we would write as A e to the j omega t, where A is the amplitude and omega is the frequency. So we can also kind of use this to explain the phase delay that we talked about in the time domain a little more, or using different colors. If red is my input and blue is my output, so it's one thing to think about this in terms of angular phase delay, where again, if they're 180 degrees out of phase, it would look like this, but we also might be interested in, okay, well, what is the actual time delay between the waves? And to do that, we're gonna insert more complex algebra that you're just gonna take my word for if you don't remember it. So rule in complex algebra, if we have A e to the J theta times B e to the J phi, that is equal to A B e to the J theta plus phi, and pardon me as I have to check my notes here because I can never quite remember how to just do this part from memory. So if we multiply e to the negative j inverse tangent rc omega times a e to the j omega t, we can add these two exponents, I believe, and that's going to give us a times e to the j omega t minus rc. At least that is what I have written in my notes, and I feel like I messed up an inverse tangent there or something, so just kind of ignore that little aside. I think I messed up something in my notes there, and I am not going to bother backtracking or fixing whatever magical step I skipped there. Point is, it's delayed by the time constant. So if you actually want to know how far behind the output signal is in seconds from the input, it's that time constant RC, which we saw in a previous video, as for the step response of this circuit, how long it takes to get to, I believe, 63.7% is the magic number of the final steady state value. That is one time constant tau. Well, when you're driving it with a sine wave instead of a step response, then <clears throat> here you go. The output is delayed 0.1%. 
one time constant from the input. Again, I botched the algebra there and have something wrong in my notes. This is a bit of an aside. We're not as worried about all the phase stuff here as we would be in a system dynamics class. But if you want to find the time domain representation here, again, output is one time constant behind the input. Okay, great. We have an equation for V out as a function of V in. And remember, we want to know, well, what do the graphs look like? What does V out look like as a function of frequency? And what does our phase difference look like as a function of frequency? And we can look at, okay, what are the interesting limits here as either omega approaches zero, or we have a DC input, or omega approaches infinity. And just kind of looking at the amplitude part in the fraction here, we see omega is down there in the denominator. So when omega goes to zero, this whole term is gonna cancel out. We're just gonna get one over one. So when frequency is zero, then our output is just gonna be equal to our input. And as omega gets bigger and bigger, the denominator is gonna to go to infinity and this fraction is gonna to go to zero. So usually these graphs will be plotted on a logarithmic scale. So you have one, 10, 100, 1,000, and so on. And the plot for this first order circuit is gonna look something like that, where you kind of have a little notch where things are pretty flat for a while and then they start to dip off. And at what we call the cutoff frequency, which is again gonna be that magic time constant one over RC, that's when we're gonna be around, I forgot to write the exact number down, I think it's 70.7% of the input. Let me double check that real quick. So, yep, that is 70.7%. Don't get that mixed up with the 63.7% from the step response. And then in the phase graph, again, we're gonna start out at zero, where this kind of intuitively makes sense. If you imagine kind of charging this circuit up very slowly, then the output is gonna be in phase or lined up with the input because you're giving the capacitor enough time to charge fully. But as you start going faster and faster, it's going to start lagging. So the capacitor voltage will be behind the input voltage. That's gonna look something like this, where it kind of drops down to negative 90 degrees. So lagging like the blue line here, it doesn't get fully out of phase like the green lag. And again, so if you actually had numbers and went into MATLAB or something and plotted this, these are the rough shapes of the graph you would get. And you can see finally now why this is called a low pass filter, because it is passing or allowing through the low frequencies, kind of below the cutoff frequency, and then it is cutting off or getting rid of the high frequency signals. So if instead of a pure sine wave, you send kind of a noisy sine wave into a low pass filter, just like you might have mechanical vibrations in a mechanical system, you can have electrical noise on a sensor or a power line or whatever it is, you send that noisy signal as the input voltage into a low pass filter, it is kind of gonna clean up the signal and get rid of that higher frequency noise and give you a nice clean low frequency component of the signal out with the caveat that if your cutoff frequency is too low, then you're also going to start attenuating the part of the signal that you care about. So if your signal that you care about is at a higher frequency than your cutoff frequency, then you're also going to reduce the amplitude of that signal. So a couple different notes on kind of alternative notations here. You may see negative three dB as a common way to express the amplitude at this cutoff frequency. So there, here we have V out as a function of V in. Sometimes it is common to bring V in over, kind of divide both sides and then express this as, say, depending on the textbook you're using, they might use the letter H to represent the frequency response in the complex form where that is the amplitude of j omega times e to the j phase of j omega. So again, depending on where you look, over here is amplitude and here is phase. You might also see this expressed as gain in, oops, decibel form. So something like 20 log V out over V in, depending on the industry or application or something, it might be log base 10. So I'm not gonna get too worried about decibels here because again, in audio, they might have a specific convention or something. But again, if you see that negative three dB number for, oh, the signal is attenuated by three dB, that usually means they're using 
decibels and kind of the absolute voltages. In this course, we're not too worried about it, but as you get more into kind of pure electrical engineering and especially audio, um, decibels get thrown around a lot. But again, we're not too worried about it here. The basic concept is what you should remember. Low pass filter means you, in the frequency domain, graph looks like this. You are passing the low frequency signals and attenuating the high frequency signals. And in the time domain, that means if you have kind of a sine wave with multiple frequency components and you feed it into one of these low pass filters, assuming you have chosen your resistor and capacitor values to give you the correct cutoff frequency, you're going to filter out the high frequency components and keep the low frequency components. So in the next video, we're going to kind of more quickly go through the derivation to see what happens if you switch the capacitor and resistor around to make a high pass filter.